please welcome former Prime Minister of Norway, Global Citizen Global Board Member Erna Solberg, Managing Director and CEO Food Systems for the Future, Ertherin Cousin, and EFAD Goodwill Ambassador, Global Citizen Advocate, Sabrina Dowry Elba. Thank you so much. Um, might I just say it's an absolute honor to be here standing next to two women who I absolutely adore and admire for their work uh, to end world hunger. As you know, we have Erna Solberg, who served as Norway's 35th Prime Minister, who we're all proud of, and played an important role as a co-chair of the UN Sustainable Development Goals Advocacy Group. In the role, a significant outcome was the Arctic call to action on food security and climate change, which urged governments to step up efforts and preserve genetic diversity, including through well-managed seed and plant banks. And we also have the amazing Earthman Cousin, who previously served as executive director of the World Food Program, my sister food organization. In this role, she led the world's largest humanitarian organization at a time when the world was faced with dramatic increases in food prices that created a global food crisis. She is now Managing Director and CEO of Food Systems for the Future. As you just saw, the statistics around food insecurity worldwide are terrible. I actually just came back from a visit to the Horn. I was with EFAD launching the Crisis Response Initiative because we believe in rural people and we believe in investing in them. Speaking to the farmers and the people on the ground and hearing you know, our long-term efforts on the ground being changed into short-term solutions by the rural people, selling cars, selling whatever they had, selling their livestock, which in Somalia, if you know, is capital. Uh, it was devastating to see. Everything you hear about the drought, everything you hear about the famine is absolutely true. And as a proud Somali, it breaks my heart. Um, I want to say that the important thing that we must remember is that the global food system systems is a fragile web of interconnections. And I think it's really easy to forget and see all the connections if you're not there in the region. So it was important for me to go and educate myself. And I hope that that's what you'll be able to educate yourselves on today in this panel. A crisis in one part of the world, the brutal invasion, is having catastrophic consequences for millions in another part of the world. Today, we're gonna to focus our conversation on the steps leaders can take around the world to avoid a global food system catastrophe. So, if I can turn to my first question to Erna. The war in Ukraine is affecting the very delicate balance of the global food supply chain. There is a shortage of fertilizer being exported by Russia that's affecting smallholder farmers all over the world, and, a, and supply of critical cereal and staples has also been hampered. What are the implications of this long term? And how can we start to bring relief where it is needed most? It's, it's an extremely difficult uh, situation because uh, even though Ukraine is not the biggest producer, it's one of the largest exporters. Meaning that, uh, for example, the World Food Program uh, would uh, use, buy a lot of grain from, from Ukraine. So the system that is based to help in crisis is now ruined in a way by the war. Uh, countries like, especially the Middle East and Egypt, very dependent on, on buying from Ukraine. And at the same time, we know that we have environmental issues other places. We see India locking down on exports. So we see that uh, um, there is going to be much more difficult to get enough food, and the prices is going to rise for everybody uh, who has, um, who have to go to shop. And I think people see that today. And you know, this leads in, one thing is that it leads to starvation, hunger, and with all of that effect, but it also leads to unrest in a lot of countries. We know that food leakages is one of those things that uh, makes unrest more, um, much, much uh, tougher in a lot of countries. And then um, we will need to try to work together, all countries, to make sure that we don't now uh, put uh, blockages on selling to the countries that need the most, making sure that we can fund and get enough grain for the, the world uh, uh, food program and make sure that that's, that's in, in place. And then you have to long, work on the long-term uh, 
um, things that will make our food systems more sustainable. And, uh, but the short crisis is going to be felt by everybody. I think it's felt by consumers in uh, the US already. It's going to be felt by uh, the voters and consumers in Norway, and uh, uh, because the prices will be higher. So it will, it will just be one more example also of the problem in one place in the world affects the rest of us, and that we have to find global solutions, that we have to work together on uh, much better food systems in the future. And uh, we also have to have this, uh, if there is a crisis somewhere, we need to have a system that will function also for the most vulnerable people, even though some of the large producers fall out. No, I absolutely agree. I was surprised to learn that Somalia gets 100% of its wheat via Ukraine, via Egypt, and, I, and then, you know, it's astonishing. I think if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we need to work as a global community and also that we need to set up rural people to be resilient because crisis will happen, climate is changing, conflict will always be there. Um, so it's about building resilience as well. Erthren, if I may ask. Today, a report titled Food Security and the Coming Storm was released by Eurasia Group and Every BB Sustainable Strategies. It highlights the devastating effects of the Ukraine invasion on global food security. If you could paint a picture for us of the scenarios the paper highlights and the current status of the global food system, that would be great. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to Global Citizen for this opportunity to participate because this is the audience that we need to discuss these issues because you don't see it on CNN at night. And unless we can begin this conversation to ensure that policymakers are, are making the right decisions, that investors, both public and private sector, are investing the capital that is necessary we will see a perfect storm. We know that this crisis is looming. And that's what the paper highlights. The paper recognizes that this didn't start with Russia's invasion into Ukraine, but that was the tipping point of the challenges of what we now are calling a perfect storm. Because the issues related to the, um, the, the, the things that, like the weather, the weather and post-COVID and access to fertilizer, all of those issues began before. And then they were exacerbated by the challenges that were just described by the prime minister with the Russian invasion into Ukraine. And what the paper, what the, what the paper states very clearly is that regardless of the outcome of this crisis in Ukraine, we are going to see more hungry people. And the, crisis, the, the outcome that is most likely a stalemate is the worst for hungry people. Because what that means is that the challenges that we're witnessing today with lack of access by farmers into, Ukraine, into the Ukraine areas that, uh, where wheat and other commodities are harvested will continue. What it means is that the challenges that we are seeing today with the ports that are creating the inability of food to move in and out of the Black Sea in the way that is necessary. The grain silos in Ukraine are filled mm -hmm. as we sit here, but they can't get it out because they can't get it out through the Black Sea. And so there's wheat and other commodities in the field that when harvested, there's no place to put it. And so the potential for that wheat to rot is quite high. And as the Prime Minister stated, the challenge is that countries like Somalia and Kenya, as well as Turkey, Egypt, and Iraq, are all net importing countries of wheat from Russia and Ukraine. But it's not just about the net importing countries. Because what happens is when there's less commodities in the global system, the entire price, uh, the prices go up for all of us. And that's what we're witnessing today as we see the increase in food on our own grocery shelves. And let me just tell you, expect another increase before the end of the year. And so if that is creating angst 
For people in Europe and the United States, imagine what it means for the three billion people who before this crisis began could not afford access to a diverse and healthy diet on a regular basis. And the expectation is that that number will increase by between 30 and 45 million people as stated in the paper. So you will see an increase in those who can't afford the enough food. You'll, you, we will also witness an increase in those who are acutely hungry. There are 49 million people right now living on the verge of starvation. The paper estimates through the modeling that they've done that that number will increase by between 8 and 13 million people over the next 12 months. And then there are we expect that those who are food insecure, who cannot find access to a food on a regular basis, that that number could go up, as estimated in the paper, by between 275 million and 300 million people. And those numbers are confirmed not just by this paper, but by all of the institutions. WFP, in particular, has been raising the alarm about the number of people who are potentially going to go hungry as a result of this perfect storm. And I don't think we need to remind anyone that those three billion people who are the least, you know, outputters, the least causes for the all, all of this happening, suffer the most and are really affected the most. It's so unfortunate. I want to ask to both of you, actually, the food price crisis of 07 and 08 caused soaring food insecurity. What was learned from that time and how can it be applied to what we're going through now? I think what happened was... Um too little learning in one way, or too little distribution of the learning we had, and I think that's uh, when when uh, and I think that's one of our problems. When an acute crisis is in a way solved, uh, you start to work in the slow process of getting, you know, trying to change the systems, and there was done a lot of work by different UN agencies around the world. But you know, you have to get down to the local farmer. You have to get local farmers to get access to the knowledge on how to double their, their output with uh, less ingredients and less, um, uh, and less uh, climate and, and environmental effects. It's possible. It's not, we know that by AI, but we know that we don't get that. And it will increase local farmers' income. It will increase food production locally. And we know that we have the systems, but it's not, uh, it's not given to uh, those who really need it. And that's why I believe that the big fertilizer companies, that all of them should develop systems of working much more close with their old customers to make sure that they produce better, better income, better output, and, uh, and get uh, into that knowledge base. Uh, and I think we could then increase, import, uh, increase uh, dependency on imports a lot for a lot of countries who today have fertile ground but are importing a lot. The second thing I think is extremely important um, uh, forward is to make sure that we also try to get um, uh, the impact on uh, community level on education and food and get that together because if you really want to reach the poorest family you need to get them in you need to put food into the benefit system we used to discuss this uh, between as i was prime minister and she was the secretary general or, uh, and you know how can we get girls to school i talked about that yesterday give them food she said Make sure that the family gets food. Then you can bribe all the parents to leave, to get girls to school. Then you also meet the most deprived persons. Let me just pick up on that because it is so important that we provide the assistance that is necessary to organizations like WFP who feed people in emergency situations. But we need to provide what we're calling preemptive humanitarian response to support smallholder farmers. Those 500 Amen. million smallholder farmers that can feed themselves and provide more nutritious food that will supplement the gaps in the global system and begin that transition to more sustainable agriculture that we all talk about. This is that opportunity, not as a development action, but as a humanitarian action to change the outcomes. We don't need to necessarily have that increase in hungry people that I just spoke about. If we act now, to support smallholder farmers, 500 million of them 
who produce 80% of the food that is consumed in the places where they live. And the last thing I'd say is we need to ensure that this is not just about government money. This is private sector and public sector together, creating capital stacks that change the risk port profile of businesses that can provide market opportunities across the food system. We need to do this differently if we expect the outcome to be different. Thank you for saying that. A lot of the work. You know, a lot of the work that I do now really comes from a stigma I had when I was younger that Africans necessarily don't work hard. They're looking for a handout. They're looking and waiting for aid. Let me tell you, on this trip, I didn't need to see what I already knew is rural people work very hard, and if not harder than anyone else I know. And we're looking for a way to invest in them because they're custodians of this planet. They know the ground. They know biodiversity. They should be part of the climate solution, yet they receive so little of the funding. So I want to thank you both so much for what you said today. You know, and let me just build on that before we go. Of because course. I have never met an African woman who wanted to stand in line to feed her children. The only reason she did was because she had no other options. We have an opportunity to provide those options. Thank you. Yes, no, yes. If we can, I think it'd be great to, to just close with a question to you because, you know, part of being an ambassador is about access. It's about allowing for the voices who are unheard to be heard in panels like today and discussions all around the world. So I want to put to the audience, what will you do to educate those around you and in your lives about what you've learned today? I don't know if anyone else has any closing remarks. Erna, would you like to say anything to finish up? Well, I think... Um, uh, Activism can be in a lot of different areas, like local areas, but just now I think we need activism to push on Russia to release the grain from Ukraine. So yes. put that as, as the agenda item number one, push to get the grain out. Get the grain out. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, and thank you so much. Yes, so great. <laughs>